in a small town in Taiwan. President Hamid Karzai signs the new constitution of Afghanistan. And the day is just getting started. In North America, at around 8 a.m., an email appears in the inbox of a few users. Upon opening, there's an attachment. It has a generic name like document.txt or readme.doc, and to the mind of an unsuspecting 2004 human, it looks legit. Right now, the virus also known as My Doom is now copying itself to the Windows System folder and replacing an existing file called taskmon.exe. It also creates the file shimjapi.dll in the same directory. This is a backdoor trojan that opens TCP listening ports ranging from 3127 to 3198. A TCP listening port is a network protocol that an application listens to. It acts as a communication endpoint, so in this case, it acts as a portal that can download and execute other files from wherever the virus was originally deployed. One of these files is simply named message. The worm then creates two registry keys. The first one says that whenever the computer is rebooted, the same worm will run again. The second one says that whenever the user opens Internet Explorer, the file created earlier, Shimjapi, will also run. To the unsuspecting user, nothing is happening. In the background, the worm is now propagating itself, sending emails using the original computer's network to other users. It disguises under randomly generated email addresses with generic names, like Adam, Alex, Dan, Maria, and Sandra. But this worm isn't blind, it's smart. It avoids sending itself to domains that would house users that could discover it. Domains like .edu, .gov, and others. It also avoids informational addresses like help at or admin at. And that's just before lunch. Are watching Disrupt TV. Midday sun, the worm has slowed overall global internet performance by approximately 10%. Average web page loading time slow by 50%. The computing community is reporting that one in 10 email messages now contain the virus. The SEO Group, a software company creating Linux products, offers a $250,000 reward for information, leading to the arrest of the worm's creator. The FBI and Secret Service also open investigations. A second version of the worm has surfaced, mydoom.b. This new version includes a denial of service attack against the SEO group and an identical attack against Microsoft. The worm will launch 64 threads, each of them requesting the main page of the websites. This process of requesting 64 times is repeated every second. The request is simple, git HTTP 1.1 from every infected machine throughout the globe. It's scheduled to begin in six days. Marcus Hutchins walks out the front door of an Airbnb mansion in Las Vegas. He's retrieving his order of Big Mac and fries from a delivery driver when he notices something across the street. For a moment, he wonders, is this finally it? He brushes the thought off. This is his last night in the city. He's been at DEF CON, one of the world's largest hacking conferences where, for the past week, he's been partying and upheld as a hero because less than three months earlier, he had saved the internet from one of the worst cyber attacks in history, WannaCry. Companies in Ukraine, Russia, the Netherlands, and England have all reported major disruption. He had found and triggered a secret kill switch in the self-propagating virus that had stopped the global spread. 
this had earned him major status in both white and black hat networks. Now though, as he's at the airport, the TSA agents seem to be extra lenient with him. He doesn't even have to take his laptops out of their bag. He wanders the terminals, grabbing a Coke, and sitting patiently, ready to return to his job analyzing malware at a firm called Cryptos Logic. Three men walk up. Are you Marcus Hutchins? His mind races through every possible illegal thing he's done that might have interested customs. Surely, he thought, it couldn't be the thing. That years old unmentionable crime. Was it that he may have left marijuana in his bag? The agents walked him through a security area full of monitors and then sat him down in the interrogation room. For the next few minutes, the agents struck a friendly tone, asking Hutchins about his education and Crypto's logic. For those minutes, Hutchins allowed himself to believe that perhaps the agents just wanted to know about WannaCry, perhaps just a particularly aggressive way to get his cooperation into their investigation. Then, 11 minutes into the interview, his interrogators asked him about a program called Kronos. From the age of six, Hutchins had watched his mother use Windows 95 on the family's Dell Tower desktop. His father was often annoyed to find him dismantling the family PC or filling it with strange programs. Hutchins develops a keen interest in surfing, freedom in the ocean. He also grows farther into the other kind of surfing. He becomes curious about the HTML characters behind the websites he visits and was coding rudimentary Hello World scripts in BASIC by the age of 13. He came to see programming as a gateway to build whatever he wanted. Far more exciting than even the wooden forts and catapults he built with his brother. On his 13th birthday, after years of fighting for time on the family's aging Dell, Hutchins' parents agreed to buy him his own computer, or rather, the components he requested. Within a year, Hutchins is exploring an elementary hacking forum, one dedicated to wreaking havoc upon the popular instant messaging platform, MSN. There, he finds a community of like-minded young hackers showing off their inventions. One brags of creating a kind of MSN worm that impersonates a JPEG. When someone opens it, the malware would instantly and invisibly send itself to all their MSN contacts, some of whom would fall for the bait, open the photo, which would fire off a round of messages infinitely. Around the time he turns 14, Hutchins posts his own contribution to the forum, a simple password stealer. Install it on someone's computer, and it could pull the passwords from the victim's web accounts. The passwords were encrypted, but he'd figured out where the browser hid the decryption key. When asked on the forum how many passwords he's gotten from the hack, he says he didn't. It was just a cool thing he made. Over the next few years, he sharpens his skill by executing petty hacks, including booting his entire school's admin office out of their network. He gets suspended for two weeks. The original hacking community he started on gets shut down, so Hutchins joins a new one called Hack Forums. From petty hacks to more serious ones, the community on this site has murkier ethics. Here, Hutchins, now 15 years old, brags about a botnet he had created of more than 8,000 computers, mostly hacked with simple fake files he'd uploaded to BitTorrent sites and tricked unwitting users into running. He also goes on to set up his own business. He begins renting servers and then selling web hosting services to the hack form users for a monthly fee. The Enterprise, which Hutchins calls ghost hunting, advertises itself as a place where all illegal sites are allowed. One customer asks if it was acceptable to host war as black market software. Hutchins immediately replies, Experts discover something in the code an error that will deem the attack non-functional on the day of reckoning. Some skeptics warn that the error may be a decoy intended to conceal the true purpose of Maidu. 
My Doom B is now blocking access to websites of over 60 computer security companies, as well as ads by DoubleClick and other online marketing agencies. It's spreading, but not as fast as My Doom A. One in every five emails now contain the worm. We have reached the peak. Microsoft offers an additional 250,000 to the reward. The denial of service attack begins two days earlier than expected. An estimated 1 million computers, now infected, send connections to SCO. The company responds by removing the original domain from operation. The second attack begins, this time aimed at Microsoft. Microsoft responds by directing users to a website unaffected by the attack. The attack, at this point, has remained minimal. Microsoft.com remains functional. A second worm, known as Doomchoose, has appeared. It rides the tail end of my doom by sneaking into a back door left open. Its purpose is the same as its big brother, a DDoS against Microsoft. However, it doesn't make much of a dent. My doom A stops spreading. The back door remains open. Someone triggers my doom B and stops it from spreading. The back door remains open. Cyberspace returns to relative normality. While the creator of the virus remains a mystery, the country of origin has been pinpointed to Russia. A variant of my doom attacks Google completely stopping functionality of the website for a large portion of the day. New versions begin surfacing. My Doom U, V, W, and X infect more computers and install more backdoors, sparking worries that a new, more powerful My Doom is brewing. My Doom version AO is born. Then, Just an hour ago, we had an attack. We learned from the NYSC that they've had some kind of denial of service attack on their website. U.S. authorities say North Korea may be responsible for cyber attacks on government websites in the United States and South Korea. The code was called Trojan.dozer, and much of the language it's written in appears to be reused from the My Doom worm. But the original hasn't resurfaced. The ransom money remains unclaimed. The estimated damages the virus caused roughly 38 billion US field. The individual or the group behind the virus has yet to be found, remaining in the shadows of cyberspace. And here we go. You can see already the massive amount of traffic being pushed out of this virtual machine. Uh, Every black hat hacker, there's a white hat hacker. Someone hired by a company to specialize in breaking software to ensure maximum security. These people know the ins and outs of computer science, but they started at the fundamentals. Offers foundational computer science courses for a fraction of the cost of traditional university rates. Whether you're looking to become a software developer, network architect, or just want to feed your brain new valuable information, the Computer Science Fundamentals course will help wrap your mind around computational thinking, ranging from everyday tasks to algorithms. Topics include decision trees that computers use to boil down the many into one, or computational problem solving that presents simple real-world problems to explain complex concepts. You can prepare yourself for career paths in computation via brilliant.org slash disrupt for free. Or, if you want to unlock all 60 plus courses, the first 200 people that sign up will get a 7 day trial of premium, plus 20% off the annual subscription. Build your framework at brilliant.org slash disrupt. In his mind, he still sees what he's doing as several steps removed from any real cybercrime. Hosting shady servers or stealing a few Facebook passwords hardly seems like a serious offense. He isn't, after all. 
carrying out bank fraud. After hearing about this particularly talented young hacker, a figure on the forum known as Vinny reaches out to Hutchins with an offer. He says we'll give Hutchins half the profits from every sale. They'd call the product Yupas after the Japanese Yupas tree, whose toxic sap was traditionally used in Southeast Asia to make poison darts and arrows. Hutchins agrees, and after nine months of work, the root kit goes up for sale. Hutchins doesn't ask Vinny any questions about who is buying. The money starts rolling in, always in Bitcoin. The 17-year-old tells his parents he's been working on freelance programming projects. They buy it. He purchases new game consoles and even takes up crypto trading, creating his own programs that hedged his Bitcoin buys with short selling, protecting his holdings against the dramatic fluctuations of the early crypto market. With the success of Yupiskit, Vinny tells Hutchins that it's time to build Yupiskit 2.0. He wants new features for the sequel, including a keylogger that could record victims every keystroke, the ability to see their entire screen, and a feature that could insert fake text entries and other content into the pages that the victims were seeing, something called a web inject. This last demand in particular gives Hutchins a deeply uneasy feeling. Web injects have a very clear purpose. They're designed for bank fraud. See, most banks require a second factor of authentication when making a transfer. They often send code via a text message to a user's phone and ask them to enter it on a web page. Web injects allow hackers to defeat that security measure by sleight of hand. A hacker initiates a bank transfer from the victim's account, and then when the bank asks the hacker for a confirmation code, the hacker injects a fake message onto the victim's screen, asking them to perform a routine confirmation of their identity with a text message code. When the victim enters that code from their phone, the hacker passes it on to the bank, confirming the transfer out of their account. He would now, without a doubt, be helping thieves steal from innocent victims. He refuses. A year earlier, Vinny offered to give Hutchins free weed, mushrooms, and ecstasy from Silk Road. Against his better judgment, he agrees to share his address and name to the dark web associate. Again. Hutchins declines. Knowing full well he couldn't find a better hacker than Hutchins, Vinny proposes something. Hutchins could code the updated pack just without the web inject. Hutchins agrees. As he develops the next generation rootkit over the following months, Hutchins begins attending a local community college. He develops a bond with one of his computer science professors and is surprised to discover that he actually wants to graduate but he's strained under the load of studying while also building and maintaining Vinny's malware. His dark web business partner now seems impatient to have their new route get finished. He begins paying Hutchins constantly, demanding updates. To cope, Hutchins begins turning back to Silk Road, buying amphetamines to replace his nighttime coffee binges. After nine months of all-night coding sessions, the second version of Yupa's kit is ready. But as soon as Hutchins shares the finish code with Vinny, Vinny responds with a surprising revelation. He had secretly hired another coder to create the web injects that Hutchins refused to build. With the two programmers' work combined, Vinny has everything he needs to make a fully functioning bank trojan. Hutchins is livid, speechless. He quickly realizes he has very little leverage against Vinny. The malware is already written, and for the most part, Hutchins had authored it. Vinny asks him to combine the two separate codes and reminds him if he quits now, he'll get nothing. He'd have taken all the risks, enough to be implicated, but would never receive any of the rewards. Hutchins' instincts tell him to quit. His actions go otherwise. The root kit is ready. Vinny drops the Upas branding and changes it to the name of a cruel giant in Greek mythology, the father of Zeus and all the other vengeful gods in the pantheon of Mount Olympus, Kronos. The malware is
is a modest success. It has bugs that need fixing, and those fixes fall on Hutchins' shoulder. Paired with his daytime responsibilities of studying, by night he takes more amphetamines, where he reaches states of euphoria. Only in this condition can he enjoy his work. He stays up for days, studying, coding, and then crashing into a state of anxiety and depression before sleeping for 24 hour stretches. Between the highs and lows, he meets a friend from LA called Randy. Unlike Vinny, Randy is more open about his IRL life with Hutchins. The two form a friendship and eventually Randy asks Hutchin to trade 10,000 of his money on the crypto programs. Hutchins agrees. One morning, Hutchins wakes up from a deep amphetamine bender to discover an electrical outage during the night. All of his computers had powered off just as Bitcoin's price crashed, erasing close to 5,000 of Randy's savings. Still near the bottom of his drug use, Hutchins panics. He finds Randy online and admits to losing his money. Hutchins graduates from college in the spring of 2015. Looking to start life outside of schooling on the right foot, he quits the amphetamines, cold turkey. What follows are weeks of withdrawal. He falls behind on his Kronos work, and eventually, Vinny cuts him off. The Bitcoin payments stop coming. Hutchins largely leaves the hacking underworld and retreats into video games and Breaking Bad. During one episode, he receives tunnel vision, a sense of impending doom. He only leaves his home rarely to meet up with his friends or swim in the ocean. The waves provide him comfort, a reminder of his mortality. Months clean, some of his strength returns. He rejoins cyberspace, this time as an anonymous blogger reverse engineering some of the largest botnets in the wild. Over time, his readership grows into the tens of thousands, and he gains mutual respect between the black hat and white hat communities. Through this, he receives a job offer from Ramsos Logic. When he sees the six-figure annual salary, it was more than he has ever earned as a cybercriminal malware developer. Hutchins comes to understand for a talented hacker, crime truly doesn't pay. A young anesthesiologist is finishing a lunch of chicken curry and chips from the hospital cafeteria, trying to check his email before he's called back into surgery. But he can't log in. The email system is down. He shares a brief collective grumble with the other doctors in the room who are all accustomed to computer problems across the NHS. After all, their PCs are still running Windows XP. Just then, an IT administrator comes in the room and tells the staff that something more unusual is going on. A virus is spreading across the hospital's network. One of the PCs in the room has rebooted, and now, it isn't until they check the world news to discover the attack is global. Cybersecurity researchers name the worm WannaCry. After the extension, it adds to file names after encrypting them. As it paralyzes machines and demands its Bitcoin ransom, WannaCry is jumping from one machine to the next using a powerful piece of code called Eternal Blue. Eternal Blue was stolen from the NSA by a group of hackers known as the Shadow Brokers. It leaked into the open internet a month earlier. Marcus Hutchins is on vacation. He returns from picking up lunch at his local fish and chips shop. He sits down in front of his computer and discovers the internet is on fire. Within minutes, a hacker friend who goes by the name Caffeine sends Hutchins a copy of WannaCry's code. With his lunch still sitting in front of him, he begins dissecting it. 
First, he spins up a simulated computer on a server that he runs in his bedroom. Complete with fake files for the ransomware to encrypt, he runs the program in the quarantine test environment. He immediately notices that before encrypting the decoy files, the malware sends out a query to a certain, very random looking, web address. This strikes Hutchins as significant, if not unusual. When a piece of malware pings back to this sort of domain, that usually means it's communicating with a command and control server somewhere that might be giving the infected computer instructions. Hutchins copies the long website, strings it into his web browser, and finds. So he visits the domain registrar. And at exactly 308, he registers the address. He hopes that in doing so, he'll either be able to steal control away from some of the victim's computers, or at least he'll gain a tool to monitor the number and location of infected machines, a move that malware analysts call sinkholing. Sure enough, as soon as Hutchins sets up the domain on a cluster of servers hosted by his employer, it's bombarded with thousands of connections from every new computer that's infected. The virus still infects computers, but without connection, the botnet can't continue. Hutchins tweets about the findings. He is flooded with hundreds of emails from other researchers, journalists, and system admins trying to learn more about the plague devouring the world's networks. Over the next few days, Cryptos Logic and Hutchins fight to keep the domain online. If it goes down, the malware will spread again. They battle other botnets that attempt to DDoS against the kill switch. Eventually, Cloudflare steps in and offers their services. They absorb as much traffic as any botnet could throw at the kill switch domain, and the standoff is ended. Hutchins is now no longer anonymous. His newfound fame grows. A local peaches shop offers him free Zob for a year. His parents finally understand what he does for a living. But only at DEF CON did Hutchins truly allow himself to enjoy his new rock star status. It seems his crimes of past will remain that way. The agents pull up a transcription of the conversation with Randy from three years earlier, followed by a warrant for his arrest on conspiracy to commit computer fraud and abuse. Hutchins is driven to a Las Vegas jail in a black FBI SUV that looks exactly like the one he'd spotted earlier. He's allowed one phone call, which he uses to contact his boss at crypto, Salem Nino. News of his arrest spreads, and unbeknownst to him, the hacker community is raising the alarm, demanding his freedom. On the day he's arrested, a pair of well-known cybersecurity professionals named Tara Wheeler and Deviant Olam are flying back to their home in Seattle from Las Vegas. The two have never met Hutchins and barely even interacted with him on Twitter. Wheeler has just received a five-figure severance package from the security giant Symantec because her division had been shuttered. She and Olam have been planning to use the money as a down payment on a new home. Instead, on a whim they decide to spend it bailing out Marcus. Within 24 hours of leaving Las Vegas, they get a flight back to the city, and after many mix-ups, with a few minutes to spare, they hand the courthouse clerk a bail check. From here, Hutchins awaits trial in a crowded halfway house, while even more forces in the hacker community are gathering to come to his aid. Two well-known veteran lawyers, Brian Klein, and hacker defense attorney, Marcia Hoffman, take his case pro bono. On the condition he pleads not guilty and remains under house arrest in Los Angeles where Klein has an office. Over the next two months, the lawyers chip away at his case. Eventually, he's allowed to travel beyond his temporary Marina Del Rey home and use computers once again. Cryptos Logic has him on unpaid leave so he spends his days surfing and cycling down the long seaside path that runs from the apartment to Malibu. He's in the city he's always dreamed of living in, but the circumstances leave him depressed. He's tormented by the truth. Despite all the talk of his heroics, he knows 
deep down, he is guilty. He's offered a deal. If he agrees to reveal everything he knows about the identities of other criminal hackers and malware authors, they would recommend a sentence of no prison time. Hutchins hesitates. He says he doesn't actually know anything about the identity of Vinny, their real target. But he also says that, on principle, he opposes snitching. He refuses. Soon afterward, prosecutors hit back with a superseding indictment new set of charges that bring the total to 10, including making false statements to the FBI in his initial interrogation. Hutchins and his lawyers see the response as a strong-arm tactic, punishing Hutchins for refusing to accept the first offer. After losing a series of motions, including one to dismiss his Las Vegas airport confession as evidence, Hutchins finally accepts a plea bargain in April 2019. This new deal is arguably riskier than the one he's been offered earlier. They now agree only to make no recommendation for sentencing. Hutchins would plead guilty to two of the 10 charges and would face as much as 10 years in prison and a half a million dollar fine. The choice is up to the judge. all sides of the human existence, both young, old, career criminals, those like yourself. One might view the ignoble conduct that underlies this case against the backdrop of what some have described as the work of a hero. And that is, what gives this case in particular its incredible uniqueness? If we don't take the appropriate steps to protect the security of these wonderful technologies that we rely upon each and every day, it has all the potential to raise incredible havoc. And it's going to take individuals like yourself, who have the skill set, to come up with solutions. The final call in the case of Marcus Hutchins today is a sentence of time already served, with a one-year period of supervised release. Hutchins is a free man. I have recently been thinking about quite an interesting idea, uh, the concept of getting old and how different people uh, age in their own unique way. Uh, and there are mm, quite a few people I know that are, for example, 40 years old, even my colleagues who are both 20, uh, stop learning, uh, stop uh, adapting to new world, new technologies and for example I have a grandma, she's 75 years old and without any problems she uses smartphones and uh, for example Netflix uh, so the point is that I think getting old is really your choice you allow yourself to stop learning to stop adapting thank you Man, our, our clever human lives in a maze. <laughs>